this God that we serve is really incredible. because I've been buried under so much rubble and fable and tradition, you can't find me. And he says, if you're gonna find me, you're gonna have to search. Or maybe we don't have our eyes open. is something that we do because we're so grateful for what he does. So our topic tonight is who is Israel? That's a big subject. A lot of people are very, you might say, confused on the issue. And I really think it's something that we have to sort out in our own minds because there's some things coming, uh, possible deceptions coming as to who is Israel and how we fit into the whole program. And we're going to touch on a little bit of that tonight. And, and see what the promises that were made to Israel and see how they were fulfilled or they weren't fulfilled. And then we're going to go into the New Testament and see what the Messiah had to say about those ancient prophecies and how they would be fulfilled and see how that comes to be at the end of the book. So we're going to take you right through a little bit of history and then we're going to go into the end. And actually, we're going to end up in Revelation again tonight in the book of Revelation with the, I believe, what is the answer to our question. So before we start, let's bow our heads for prayer. Father in heaven, we have another subject tonight that is of utmost importance for us to understand. It will save us a lot of challenges if we know this. And Father, we ask that you help us tonight to see your word clearly for what it says uh, so that we can know this question, who is Israel? Father, we ask that you open our minds to the word. We pray this in Yeshua's name. Amen. So when you think of Israel, who do you think of? Just give me some names. Who do you think of when you think of Israel? Yes. Jacob. Good. Who else? Pardon me? The redeemed. Interesting. Yes. Yes, sir, Arafat, okay. The ten tribes scattered abroad. Ten tribes scattered abroad, okay, yeah, that fits. Who else? Come on. Us, us, us. us. okay. Pardon me? The chosen of God, okay, the redeemed, the chosen of God, us, that's good. That's making me feel really good right now. Uh, somebody else, I'm thinking of one other name specifically that I haven't heard tonight. Isaac, the Jewish people, come on, Abraham, that's what I'm thinking. Abraham is known as the father of the Jewish nation, isn't that right? That's when he was called out of Ur of the Chaldees, and, he, and God had told him that he would be the father of many nations. In fact, his seed would be as the sand of the sea, and also as numerous as the stars in the heavens which is quite a few now that we're on this side of science and we can actually see that the stars of heaven are quite a few. I don't know if there's ever been any that many people living on the planet entirely. 
in the whole history of the planet as many stars in the sea. So, or stars in the sky. So could that have a bigger meaning? Interesting, isn't it? Could that have a bigger meaning than just on this planet that he's the father of? He's also known as the father of faith. He was faithful beyond any other, wasn't he? He was, willing to sacrifice his son for God's cause. That's more than anyone has ever asked, been asked to do, any human being outside of Yeshua, who, of course, sacrificed himself for his cause that he was doing. So Israel, for sure, the father of Israel started at Abraham, but we can see, of course, the lineage goes back, and those would, there would be people that would argue that the language of Israel goes back to creation. Is that possible? It could be possible. Why couldn't it? Sure it could. But at the start of the nation, surely we can say Abraham. And then we had Isaac and Jacob. Now I want to ask you a question. Who were the promises to, to Israel, when it came to sons? Who was the promises handed down to when it came to the sons? Pardon me? Firstborn. Would you agree with that? Sure, it's the firstborn. Let's look at the firstborn of Abraham. Did he get all the promises? What happened? Well, we can, we, that one's easy. He had his first son with Hagar. And God did not count that as his firstborn. That when we go to the second son... When we go to the second in the line, who's the second? Isaac? Who got the promises with that one? Who got the promises with that one? Isaac. Isaac. Esau, wasn't Esau the firstborn? But Jacob, he ended up passing it on to Jacob got those promises. So we see now, we've seen a pattern develop. We see that God actually isn't following what he seems to have laid down. Would you agree with that? Somebody's got to ask the question, how come? Why isn't the firstborn? Now let's take Jacob. Who got the promises through Jacob? Judah. Judah. Was Judah the firstborn? Reuben was the firstborn. A lot of people thought that Joseph should have got the promises. Do you see how things don't always work out the way you'd expect? With this subject of Israel, things have not worked out the way that it was expected to work out. And the problem that we have today is people are forgetting that God is allowed to adapt things to the way it works out. Because, because those firstborn sons were not faithful and they were not going to be faithful, God changed things. And people don't like that because they think that God changes not. Well, we have to use things in context. We have to pull things into context. If people do not follow God, he is not bound to carry out his promises that he gave them. He's not bound. He's not bound under any covenant. Now let's look at this here. Let's look at some of these texts. Yahweh appeared to Solomon the second time, and as he appeared to him in Gideon, and Yahweh said to him, I have heard your prayer and your supplication that you have made before me. Now we all know who Solomon, a thousand years after Abraham, and we know the story wasn't exactly roses all the way to him, but he is the king that built the temple and he wanted to have a place for God to dwell in. I have consecrated this house which, I have, or which you have built to put my name there forever. And my eyes and my heart will be there perpetually. Now, I don't know if your interpretation of the word forever. Has anyone ever looked up the word forever in a concordance? I'm not talking about a dictionary. I'm talking about a concordance. And what does it mean? 
Could someone tell me what it means? Many things. Oh, many things. Hmm. Perpetually. Many things? So are you going to tell me that I can make that word mean whatever I want then? I don't know about you, but when I read that, that God is saying that that temple will stand there forever. That's what it says. And that's what he meant when he said it. But we know it's not there, and we have to know why. Now, if you walk before me as your father David walked, in integrity of heart and in uprightness to do according to all that I have commanded you, and if you keep my statutes and my judgments, you see some conditions here? You see the conditions? The conditions of the covenant. Then I will establish the throne of your kingdom over Israel for how long? Is David's throne in Israel today? Come on. Is David's throne in Israel? There's not even a temple. Something happened to break this promise. As I promised David your father, saying, you shall not fail to have a man sit on the throne of Israel. Don't forget the ifs, right? Did you remember the ifs? That was the if to this covenant. So this agreement that God made to uh, David's son, Solomon, was conditional upon the what? Do you remember what it was? Let's look at it. If you walk in integrity of heart and uprightness to do all that I have commanded you and if you keep my statutes and judgments. The conditions for Israel having the covenant that God made with them fulfilled upon them was upon this text right here. But if you and your sons at all turn from following me and do not keep my commandments and my statutes, which I have set before you, but go and serve other gods and worship them, then I will cut off Israel from the land which I have given them, and this house which I have consecrated for my name I will cast out of my sight. Israel will be a proverb and a byword among all peoples. Now tell me, has this happened? Absolutely, it's happened. It's happened. Most definitely. And as for this house, which is exalted, everyone who passes by it will be astonished and will hiss and say, why has Yahweh done this to the land, to this land, and to this house? The instant... Oops, I missed a slide here. Why has he done this? Let's just... Let's, you tell me why he's done this. Why has he done this to this house? It was upon the conditions. Can you tell me that? They didn't, they didn't follow him, correct? They didn't follow him. Now let's see what uh, Jeremiah has to say here. The instant I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to pluck it up and to pull it down and to destroy it, if that nation against whom I have spoken will turn from their evil, I will repent of the evil that I thought to do to them. And the instant that I speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to build it up and to plant it, if it does evil in my sight not to obey my voice, then I will repent of the good which I said I would do to them. This is all very reasonable, I think. Wouldn't you say? Sure it is. This is just reasonable. Thus says Yahweh of hosts, the God of Israel, amend your ways and your doings, and I will cast you, or I will cause you to dwell in this place. Do not trust in these lying words, saying, the temple of Yahweh, the temple of Yahweh, the temple of Yahweh are these. Now, what does that mean to say that? That means that we have some people that are claiming to be God's house. And God would never destroy us because he gave us those promises. Do you understand that? Is people will sit there in denial of their disobedience, claiming all the time that God is with them. Can we put some present truth context on this? 
This seems to be the story all the way through history, is that churches come and go and they think that God has started them and, and everything ends with them. But unless they follow on in obedience as God leads, he will ultimately do what he did for Israel and cast them out of his sight. On the road to the kingdom, there are no stopping places. There just isn't. There's no stopping places. Deuteronomy, now it shall come to pass if you diligently obey the voice of Yahweh, your God, to observe carefully all his commandments, which I commanded you today, that Yahweh, your God, will set you high above all nations of the earth. Now this was a promise given through Moses that he would set them high above all the earth. Now, if we're looking at literal Israel today, would you say that this promise is, has been fulfilled? Would you say that? No. Something had happened. Could this promise had, have been fulfilled? Absolutely. God is true to his word. So the only reason why it couldn't be fulfilled is if they didn't obey. I think that's totally obvious. Yahweh will establish you as a holy people to himself, just as he has sworn to you, if you keep my commandments, the commandments of Yahweh your God, and walk in his ways. But if your heart turns away so that you do not hear and draw away and worship other gods and serve them, I announce to you today that you shall surely perish. And that's kind of what happened to them as a nation. But they're coming back, aren't they? Haven't you noticed that? They're coming back. They're in the news almost every day. And one has to ask, is this God's plan? Is he raising up his people? Is he actually working with them again? Deuteronomy again, see, I have set before you today life and good, death and evil. Daniel tells us a little bit more when they were cast into captivity, taken into Babylon. Daniel was praying in Daniel chapter 9, and he was reading the books of Jeremiah because the restoration of uh, Israel has a lot to do with the prophecies of Jeremiah and the visions that he had. Daniel had been reading these visions and recognized that the 70 years of captivity was coming to a close, and he was praying for his people. And as he was studying the books of Jeremiah. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by the books of the, uh, the number of years specified by the word of Yahweh through Jeremiah the prophet, that he would accomplish 70 years in desolation in, of Jerusalem. And I prayed to Yahweh my God and made confession and said, O oh God, great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant and mercy with those who love him, and with those who keep his commandments. Daniel understood. Daniel understood that God keeps his covenant with these people. Daniel chapter 9, verse 22. It goes on Daniel's prayer, and then it goes in, and the angel Gabriel comes to him and helps him to understand what he's praying about. And what he's praying about is the prophecies of Jeremiah with the restoration of Jerusalem. And he informed me and talked with me and said, O oh, Daniel, I have now come forth to give you skill to understand. Seventy weeks or sevens are determined for your people and for your holy city. Now there was some conditions here that we're going to look at, but God had said that seventy weeks are determined for your people or seventy sevens. Now, when it's written like that, it could be 77s, as in sabbatical years, which is one in seven. So this could be sabbatical years, and this is the way it actually works out. So it's technically 490 years. And this does go along with what Yeshua said, is how many times should you forgive your brother? Seventy times seven. And he knew that all too well because he is the one that gave this prophecy to Israel. And he is the one that forgave Israel all those 490 years. 
It was almost like he was pointing to this prophecy when he did that. Just like he was pointing to this prophecy. So let's see what God said that the Jewish people were to fulfill. Finish the transgression. Now let's think about that. Did the nation of Israel at the time of Yeshua finish transgression? Considering they crucified their own Redeemer, I would say they didn't finish transgression. To make an end of sins, we could say the same thing. They didn't make an end of sins. To bring reconciliation for iniquity? No, because that means they have to repent, right? To bring in everlasting righteousness? Surely not, because we're not in the kingdom, so everlasting righteousness has not come in. To seal up vision and prophecy. When we look at the conditions that were to be fulfilled upon Israel, had they obeyed and followed God, they would have had the kingdom by now and to anoint the most holy. So let's have a look and see what we can find here in the New Testament and try and make some sense out of this. In in Mark chapter 1, it tells us, now after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God, saying the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. Now when you say something like, like that, the time is fulfilled, aren't you referring to something when you say that? Would you say? Could it be possible that he was actually referring back to the prophecies that said at the end of 490 days or years, weeks, it actually says? Could it be that at the end of that time, they were to anoint the most holy and the time had come when he said the time is fulfilled? Let's explore that just a little bit more and see what he has to say. Then as he was now drawing near the uh, descent of the Mount of Olives, this is going now the end of the ministry, the whole multitude of the disciples uh, began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of Yahweh, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees called him, called from the crowd, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. But he answered and said to them, I tell you that if these should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. Now as he drew near, he saw the city and wept over it, saying, If you had known, even you, especially in this your day, the things which make for your peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. So he had come to bring peace, but they were, it was hidden from their eyes. Why do you suppose that? If you're not walking in obedience, do you have a hard time seeing the light? Sure. We're told what they did is they were in disobedience, so they couldn't see the light. The light of the world they would not even recognize. For days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment embankment around you, surround you, and close you in on every side, and level you to the ground, your children within you to the ground, and they will not leave you one stone upon another, because you did not know the time of your visitation. Let's look at this word here, visitation. If we can take what Daniel said, It said 490 years are determined for you and your people. In other words, that's it. That was the end of their probation, which I believe is what that means. Now, Yeshua here is saying, because you didn't know the time of your visitation. If we look at that word visitation, it actually means inspection. It means inspection. So when is the inspection? It's atonement, isn't it? It's atonement. They were visited after the 490 years and the inspection by the Almighty was done. We think of the inspection as he came in at Passover by the priests and Pharisees to inspect the Passover lamb. But God was inspecting his people. 
during that time, during that three and a half year ministry. He came at the time of inspection. Matthew 21 helps us a little bit more to see what's going on. Here, another parable, there was a certain landowner who planted a vineyard and set a hedge around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a tower. And he leased it to the vine dressers and went into a far country. Now, when the vintage time drew near, he sent his servants to the vine dressers that they might receive its fruit. And the vine dressers took his servants, beat one, killed one, and stoned another. He, again, he sent servants more than the first, and they did likewise to them. Now, let's just stop right here, and I want to ask you, do you know what this parable is about? Can you, have you got it figured out yet? You haven't got it figured out yet? Well, I think if you use your imagination, he's talking to the, par- the Pharisees, and they asked him the, what led into this parable. They asked him, by whose authority do you do these things? And then he sets up a parable to actually show them by whose authority he does these things. And the Pharisees actually knew exactly who he was talking about here. They knew exactly what was going on. They just didn't know where he was going with it. As he continued, and then he said, Then last of all, he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. But when the vine dressers saw the son, they said among themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and seize his inheritance. So they took him and cast him out of the vineyard and killed him. Do you think they knew who this was yet? Well, this hadn't come about yet, had it? This part. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those vine dressers? Now, if you heard this parable for the first time, what would be your response? If you're just listening as one of the common people, what would you expect to be the response? Kill them? You know the end of the story, that's why. Would you agree? There would be some kind of judgment, right? Sure there would. And they said to him, he will destroy those wicked men miserably and lease his vineyard to other vine dressers who will render to him the fruits in their season. Now, as we've been looking at this, we've been thinking that God's been pretty reasonable along the way. If you obey, then I will do this, right? He's just being reasonable. Would you say this is reasonable? You would say this is reasonable. Okay. Well, some of them said this, and when they heard it, they said, certainly not. This is in a different one. This is in Luke. The other one's in Matthew. The second comment is not listed in Matthew, and I have no idea why they didn't include it, but it's listed in Luke. So we had his disciples there, and they quickly responded, kill those servants. But there was another group of people said, certainly not. Who do you suppose those people were? It doesn't tell us. But can we reason it out? Do you think the disciples who were the followers of Yeshua would have said that? You think they would have said certainly not? Who would have said that? The Pharisees would have said that. And I think the rest of the story will help us with this part. Jesus said to them, have you never read the scriptures, the stone which the builders rejected? Who were the builders in this parable? Wasn't it the leaders? Sure, it was the leaders. They rejected The cornerstone has become the chief cornerstone. This was Yahweh's doing, and it is marvelous in your eyes. Goes on to say, therefore, I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken from who? You. You. And given to a nation bearing fruit. Now, the question I have, was the kingdom of God actually taken away from Israel? What do you say? Was it taken away from Israel? Okay, we've got some 
Good answers here. It was taken away, but not entirely. So what was taken away and who was it given to? And whoever falls on this stone will be broken, but on whomever it falls, it will grind him to power. I would, I'd like to suggest that whoever falls upon that stone becomes Israel. You following that? Whoever falls on this stone becomes Israel, and whoever does not will be ground to powder. That seems to be what he's saying. Now, when the chief priests and Pharisees heard his parable, they perceived that he was speaking of them. But when they sought to lay hands on him, they feared the multitude because they took him for a prophet. Now, that word perceived is actually not a good translation. Because perceiving, if you perceive something, it's not necessarily true, right? Would you agree with that? So you kind of don't get the full meaning of it. The word, the word there, the actual word, would be better translated new. There was no question in their minds. It says that they knew that he was talking about them. They knew that he had just told them that they, he was going to take the kingdom away from them. Did it happen? Let's keep going. The kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who arranged a marriage for his son and sent out his servants to call those who were invited to, to the wedding, and they were not willing to come. Same thing again. We're having a story. If they didn't get it the first time, we'll hear it a second time. Again, he sent out other servants, saying, Tell those who are invited, See, I've prepared my dinner, my oxen, my fatted cattle are killed, and all things are ready. Come to the wedding. And they made light of it and went their way, one to his farm, another to his business. The rest seized his servants, treated them spitefully, spitefully, and killed them. Do you think that this is a double parable here? Do you think this has anything to do with the last parable? Sure, sure it is. It's exactly the same story. These people that were killed were God's people, and these people that were killing them were his leaders of his people. But when the king heard about it, he was furious, and he sent out his armies and destroyed those murderers and burned up their city. I understand that when the temple was burning in Jerusalem, after the Romans had seized it and burned it, that the gold was actually dripping down in the cracks of the rocks, and the soldiers were, were digging it out as they were there. This prophecy was fulfilled. If this part of the prophecy was fulfilled, I would say he did take the kingdom from those people. Would you agree with that? Absolutely he did. Then he said to his servants, the wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Therefore, go into the highways, and as many as you find, invite them to the wedding. See, God has an extended family that were outside of the household of Israel, but he said, go and get them and bring them because I want them to be my guests. And he actually, as the rest of the story goes, he adopts them into his family and they replace those ones that were discarded. Now, does that sound a lot like replacement theology? What do you think? Does that sound like replacement theology? That's a term that we hear quite a bit. So those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all whom they had found, both bad and good, and the wedding hall was filled with guests. This is still in the future. This is still in the future. But when the king came to see the guest, he saw a man there who did not have on a wedding garment, so he said to him, friend, how did you come in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Now, I don't really think, and you know, sometimes we have to take the word for the way it says, and exactly the way it says, but I somehow don't think that in the kingdom people were going were gonna to be able to sneak in. What do you think? I think we have to use our reasoning powers and say that God's not really talking. The point is not that people are going to sneak into the kingdom. 
That's not the point in this. The point is they have to have a wedding garment. What does it mean to have a wedding garment on? Pardon me? They have to be washed and clean. Now, doesn't being washed and clean, according to the Revelation, great text in Revelation chapter 22, it says that those have, who have washed their robes have a right to the tree of life. So obedience and having a clean robe have something very much in common. Now, I want to ask again, why did Israel, why were they cut off of that? Disobedience. It's just disobedience. Sure it is. Then the king said to his servants, bind him hand and foot, take him away and cast him into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are called, but few are chosen. But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. For you neither go in yourselves, nor do you allow those who are entering to go in. These are serious, serious statements here. Serpents, brood of vipers, how can you escape the condemnation of hell? Therefore, indeed, I send you prophets, wise men, scribes. Some of them you will kill and crucify. Have you ever seen that text? Do you think that they wondered who he was? Who did he just say he was? He just said he was the I am, right here. He said, I sent you. If they were confused of his identity, they knew right there who he claimed to be. There was no confusion about, in their minds about who he was claiming to be. And some of them you will scourge in your synagogues and persecute from city to city that on you, you may come, that may come all the righteous blood shed on the earth. The blood of the righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. Surely I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. The generation that he was talking to, all these things would come upon them. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her, how often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. There are so many places in the New Testament that there should have been absolutely no confusion about who he was claiming to be. That's why they said, for blasphemy, we will stone you. Good works are fine, but for blasphemy, because they saw in his words that they were, he was claiming to be the Almighty. See your houses left to you desolate, for I say to you, you shall see me no more till you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of Yahweh. And we know the story of the fig tree, don't we? Do you remember what it actually says of the fig tree? He looked and he inspected it for fruit, and what did he find? He said, no fruit? Do you remember his last words about the fig tree, to the fig tree? He said, let no fruit grow on you forever. Forever. That's judgment. Judgment happened in Israel. So God had to do something about it. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was Yahweh's doing, and it was marvelous in, in our eyes. Now, as we're studying these things, and we're studying many things, as we reject light, it makes it more difficult to go forward. Now, we talk about just truths, maybe Bible truths, as we reject them, it's, it's hard to see forward. But if you reject the one that saves you, it's a lot harder to come back. And these people would not accept him. Now, why do you suppose they would not accept him? What do you suppose the issue that was at stake? It's one word, 
and I is in the middle of it. Pride. Pride. Pride is the sin that's been passed down to every generation. And actually, we all have a little bit of it. We all have it. But we all have to get rid of it. We all have to get rid of it. Or we will reject also. They had two prophecies. One in Abraham and his son stretched out his hand, took his knife to slay his son, but the angel of Yahweh called to him from heaven saying, Abraham, Abraham. So he said, here I am. And we know that story, how they went. The other prophecy. So Moses made a bronze serpent and put it on the pole. And so it was, if the serpent had bitten anyone, when he had looked at the bronze serpent, he lived. This is a prophecy of Yeshua being put up on a, on a cross or a stake. And if we were to look at him, because he became sin for us, our sin transfers to him and he became sin. There's two prophecies there. One in an acceptance of the son's sacrifice with Isaac and, and his father, Abraham. The other is in rejection because all of this happened in the wilderness because they rejected God as their leader. And so this is how it was fulfilled on Israel. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Now Yeshua's own words said that that nation would perish. Why is that? Because they did not believe on the Son. The only way that you can have a part of Israel today is if you believe on the Son. Now I talked to a lot of people about Israel across the water in, and across into the Mediterranean, and they, they think that that is the Israel of God today. I would say that the Bible teaches otherwise. Now here's the issue, because many people feel that they have to move to the land of Israel and be one with the nation of Israel. And when the temple gets rebuilt, some, and I don't know if you know any of these people, but some of these people even believe that they will take part in sacrificing animals in Jerusalem. They are going to spend everything they have, they will sell their houses and lands and move at the time appointed in their own minds when they, when they think it's time and go to Israel and stay there in the land of Israel and try to be one with Israel. Now, do you see a problem in that in some of the other prophecies that say when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet? He says, get out of town. You see, Israel is going to be the focal point of destruction one day, and it looks like that day's coming sooner than we think. And, you know, I've seen a few movies in my day, and some of those movies have people coming and rounding up people and putting them all in churches or they happen to be on church in a certain day and they bind the church and the torches go in. Now that's, that's Hollywood, right? But Yeshua said something very, very interesting. He said, pray that your flight be not in the winter or what? You know what he's just done? He's just told us what day our flight's on. If we wait till the last minute, our flight will be on the Sabbath. That's what he said. Because the enemy knows that if he can gather as many of God's people together, and when do they gather? When do they gather? They gather on the worship times, right? So if those people are all gathered on worship times, will it be hard to hunt them down? Now, you might think this is kind of like science fiction or Hollywood or whatever, but this is reality. When you go back in history and look at the way that wars are fought, this is how they do it. Let's get the job done easy. Now, if you were the enemy and you wanted to destroy as many people as you could at one time that were keeping the Sabbath, keeping holy days, keeping those things, what would you want them to do? 
I think that if you could gather them all in one place, you might be quite successful in destroying a lot of people at one time. What do you say? Is that reasonable? Absolutely it's reasonable. This is why understanding this is very, very important. It says in my Bible that God will come. When he comes, he will gather the elect from how far? From the four corners of the world. It doesn't say that he's going to gather them at Jerusalem. He says from the four corners of the world. But we have people that are reading prophecies that say they need to go back to Jerusalem. Are there prophecies? Yes, they are. Those were prophecies for Israel had they obeyed God. But God changed things because they didn't. And Yeshua made it perfectly clear that if they kept going in their course, the, they would come to their end. And they did. Now we can read in the book of uh, Ephesians. If you want to read more of this in the book of Ephesians, chapter 2. I'm not going to take the time tonight to go through there, but I want to really encourage the book of, you to read the book of Ephesians, especially in chapter 2. The book of Ephesians tells us that God is going to bring his family on earth together, the house of Israel and the Gentiles, to be one family to be the household of God. He has not changed the name of his people. They are still Israel. So that's where it gets a little bit confusing. He still today calls his people Israel. And that's clear. Paul writes about that in Ephesians. But they come under one roof being called Israel. Now the problem is, does that mean, does that, mean that literal Israel has somehow bypassed everything that we've read here today and they're included in that? Well, when we read in Romans chapter 9 through 11, another couple chapters that you want to be really familiar with this, is Paul is talking about the Jewish people. He says, not all Israel are Israel who are Israel. And it kind of gets a little bit confusing, but when you really try and figure out what he's saying is, all Israel will be saved, but not all Israel of the flesh is Israel. And when you put that together with what Paul says in Ephesians, he says that you're grafted into the house. You come into the house of Israel. So all Israel will be saved at the end. Everyone that comes into the house will be saved. So all Israel will be saved. It's really quite simple as we go through there. And of course, there's some other texts that we're going to have a look at here also. And if you are messiahs, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. And this is a very simple. If we become under the messiah, if we accept the messiah as our sacrifice and our king and our ruler, then we become Abraham's seed. Now, when you become Abraham's seed, you become heirs to the promises. But the way God sees us, that we are of the lineage of Abraham. So that means that we are of the house of Israel, right? It's really not that complicated. And Yeshua came and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go, uh, go and make disciples of all nations. Here's the transfer. He took the kingdom out of the hands of the leaders and he gave it into the hands of the disciples. Now, question, two questions. Were the leaders of God's people Israel? Were they Israelites? Yes. Were the leaders, were the 12 disciples, disciples Israelites? Absolutely. There was no change. He just took it out of the political and the religious from their hands and gave it into the hands of the people. And that's the way it's been transferred. This is not a replacement theology. This is what people get confused with. God never replaced Israel with anyone. He just said, you know what? You guys aren't doing your job. I'm going to give it into the hands of these people. He took it away from them and gave it to those that would produce the fruit. That's what he said he was going to do. And that's exactly what this is telling us that he did. teaching them to observe all things that I command you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. 
You know, this text is so often misused. If we can look at this in the context of Israel, and we can look at this as Yeshua saying that I sent you prophets, Yeshua claiming to be the Son of God, the Almighty, if he said this, don't you think he's referring to those things that God gave Israel? Absolutely. All things, that's commandments, statutes, and judgments. And we can read the same story in Malachi chapter 4. Malachi chapter 4 talks about a revival at the end in the statutes and judgments of God, including that. So this was Israel's job, and that job never changed. Revelation tells us something quite interesting. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me a great city, the holy Jerusalem descending out of heaven from God. Having the glory of God, her light was like a most precious stone, like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. And she had a great and high wall, uh, wall with 12 gates and 12 angels at the gates. And the names written on them, which were the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. You ever really notice that? Didn't it say somewhere that nobody's climbing up over the wall? Wasn't there a parable about that? No one's climbing over the wall? Which gate do you suppose you're going to enter in? <laughs> you have to enter in to one of the 12 tribes because they're the ones that inhabit the city. So if you don't become one of the 12 tribes by the end, you won't be going into the city because the gates have the names of the 12 tribes and you will be getting a new name and somehow it has something to do with the 12 tribes. Is those that inhabit the city have become part of Israel. That's what the Bible teaches. You become part of Israel. God counts you as a son of Israel when this happens. And then it tells us the three gates on the east, three gates on the north, three gates on the south, three gates on the west. Now the wall of the city had 12 foundations and on them were the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. Ask you another question. Were the 12 apostles of the Lamb Jewish? They were Israelites. God has created a family on earth called Israel. And Israel means, does anyone know what the word Israel means? You're probably going to get pretty close. Pardon me? Okay. L? Overcomer? With God? Very close to that. Now, when you put the name in here, this is really reasonable in that only the overcomers that have yoked up with the Savior will enter the city, and they are the true Israel. Do you see, the Bible doesn't talk about two groups of people that enter the city. It's Israel and Israel alone and literal Israel and not spiritual Israel. I have yet to find the term spiritual Israel in the Bible. It's not there. You become adopted in as if you were born into the family itself. And God counts you as a son of Abraham. A son of Abraham. So as you mingle with people, this is something that's being taught out there that moving to Israel and doing all of this because Israel is where it's at. When Benjamin Netanyahu is on the TV and he actually announces that he's just recognized that Yeshua is the Son of God and all Israel is repenting, now he has my attention. Because it says that they were cut out of the tree. They were cut out. And if he claimed that, then it says they could be grafted back in. But they're not grafted back in in any other way than accepting Yeshua, the same way you are, you and I are. It's all conditional upon accepting him as our God and Savior. That's the way it is. So 
What can we do? We can make sure that we keep our eyes on who? Yeshua. Yeshua. He's the only way. He is the way into the kingdom and our Savior. Let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, we thank you again for your word. Uh, you have put so many details in there and, and so many things that we don't need to be deceived. That's the reason why you have written this book, so that we will know your plan. Father, as we um, mingle and as we share these things with others, I pray that you will help us to understand them better and uh, work in our minds. Father, I want to ask for each one here that as we wrestle uh, at times against flesh and blood that we recognize that we're wrestling with principalities and powers and we can see past the person that's giving us the challenge and keep our focus on you. And we want you to be our wisdom and our understanding so that we can deal with all the challenges that will come. We pray this in the name of your son, Yeshua, who is our redeemer, our savior, our king. Amen. Amen. Hi, thank you for watching His Truth Seekers Ministry. Right now, I have a couple videos that I'd like to recommend that you watch. The first one is The Kingdom of Heaven. It's simply all about heaven and the scripture's description of it. The second one is The Feasts and the Faithful, the rest of the story. And this one's all about God's festivals and his calendar. If you have the internet, you can go onto YouTube and you can type in Tom Stapleton and you'll find all of his videos there. Otherwise, if you don't have the internet, we'd love to send you the DVD, and it is of no charge. Also, if this is a ministry that you'd like to support, you can send in a donation to the address on the screen at the end of this video, or you can go onto the website and make a donation there. The web address is www.end-timesprophecy.com. Thank you for your continued support.